You're listening to The Money Hour with your host, Tina Mitchell, and co-host, Keelan Harvey, on Alternative Talk AM 1150. Now, back to the show with local mortgage experts, Tina Mitchell and Keelan Harvey. Well, welcome back to The Money Hour on 1150 AM KKNW, the Saturday, September 7th show. I am your host, Tina Mitchell. And I'm your co-host, Keelan Harvey. Your local mortgage experts. It is a great day to talk about money. That's what the show is all about, how to make money, how to save money so you can have a better quality of life for you and your family. If you're hearing our show at a different time or day, you are listening to a rebroadcast. We're here to connect you with the guests that we have on the show. Please call the show at 1-855-411-50. Again, that's 1-855-411-50. 1150 or online at com. In studio right now, we have Randy Banneker of Banneker Public Affairs, Clear Path Partners. What's happening in state and local government that matters to homeowners, home buyers, and home sellers? Randy, it's always a pleasure to have you here. And as I was saying before we stepped into studio, I'm just always excited uh, to hear what you're going to bring into studio because it's always uh right at this moment information that we need to know about so thank you so much for coming back in studio oh thanks tina it's great to see you and a little bit no thank you (laughs) (laughs) and a little bit about randy randy is president of banneker public affairs and the founding partner of clear path partners randy has been engaged in our region's critical issues for more than 20 years he has extensive experience advocating complex high visible and controversial land use and public policy initiatives he protects his clients image while achieving political successes. So, Randy, you're engaged in public affairs and government relations work in our region, and you're representing groups like the Seattle King County Realtors and other organizations and businesses trying to do something with government or have government not do something to them. What major issues are you seeing right now? You know, it's, it won't come as a surprise to, to, to you guys since you're in the business, but housing affordability, housing supply is absolutely enormous in mm-hmm. terms of what uh, government, state government, local governments are trying to lean into. And, and the reason is that the forecast, our, our, our population force forecast for the next 30 years or so has the central Puget Sound region growing by 1.8 million people. Wow. Um, That's crazy. Over that 30 year period. And that, if you, if you do the math based on our current population per household, that is 830,000 households, give wow. or take. So just picture that in Central Puget Sound in King, Pierce, Nahomish, Kitsap, um, putting those units in over the next 30 years, accommodating those folks. Um, what it means is that we're really digging into new uh, housing supply strategies. Um, you mentioned the, uh, the FHA condo yes. work, which is yeah. critical. We're going to need to see a lot more condo applications, multifamily. Um, there's a lot of talk about uh, accessory dwelling units or mother-in-law apartments yep. mm-hmm. uh, going into existing neighborhoods and then certainly some duplex, triplex stuff as well. Yeah, so definitely the the shortage of housing is still there. And then you add the shortage of affordable housing. So, Randy, the state legislature took on housing issues this past session. What got passed, Randy? Well, they did a lot of work on housing. Um, they also did a lot of work on on revenue and, and new taxes. But I, I, I want to focus on two things that are that are really important for our conversation today. One was uh, House Bill nineteen twenty three, and it started as a list of mandates that cities would have to do to increase housing supply mm-hmm. in their jurisdiction. Over the course of the legislative session, it transitioned to incentives. Um, and there's some good opportunities there for uh, for new supply and, and for cities. And then secondly, and again, in companion to the FHA's work, mm-hmm. uh, we got some important legislation on condominium liability reform. That's exciting. It sounds like condo is the quickest path to getting rid of this, like it's a density issue, right? And the quickest conversion to address some of that affordable housing. Um, did the condo bill go far enough? Well, we'll see is the quick answer, but I'll I'll tick off some of the important things that they did accomplish in the bill. Before saying that, though, I mean, and again, as as you know, we're looking to condominiums as um, a critical piece in entry level ownership, yeah. mm-hmm. um, and also for the for for middle income folks. Um, condos are a way to build equity in a multifamily setting. They're mm-hmm. 
going to be a little more affordable than the single-family detached house. And they are just a fabulous way to start. They're also a fabulous opportunity for empty nesters who want to get rid of yes. the big house and and yet still stay in the in the community. But what the, what the bill did was it established some protection for members of the um, homeowner association boards mm-hmm. that had been threatened with litigation. And, and uh, I can go into that later if you want, but... Um, what's gone is this strict liability for condo construction. So uh, we, we replaced it with a notion that uh, as long as you are conforming to professional construction standards, you aren't liable to get sued. That's the, the builder. Every project was getting sued for the past 10 years or so. So we think that that this conversion, it still says that it still protects the consumer. If there's a problem, if there's a a, a material effect that that uh, that affects habitability mm-hmm. of the of the building or of the specific unit, there are recourses. There are ways to cure that problem. There are ways to to fix that. But just this um, notion of of suing for the fun of it, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, is gone. And what I think that will do is bring investors, bring developers into the market to mm-hmm. build more of these projects. No doubt, Randy, that this is going to make a, a huge impact. Um, and no wonder that builders were not willing to put themselves out there at that type of risk. So, Randy, you mentioned House Bill 1923 included a variety of measures cities, cities can take to increase housing. So, what what, what are some of those, Randy? So this is this is a tad bit wonky, but again, I want you to think about the fact that we need to accommodate about 830,000 households mm-hmm. over the next 30 years. So we need to really be aggressive about thinking, you know, where we're going to put those units. Um, so so the House bill gave uh, kind of a laundry list, and I'll just I'll just touch on a few of them. Okay. One was. Um, upzoning um, residential units uh, to 50 units per acre uh, adjacent to train stations. Okay. Mm-hmm. So we're, we're establishing a big network uh, with Sound Transit, uh, high density around train stations, upzoning to 25 units per acre around uh, um, bus stops that are our major bus stops, um, like the rapid ride system that okay. Metro operates. Uh, you know, four or more stops per hour operating, you know, 12 hours per day. Um, getting to a minimum uh, residential density of uh, six units per acre in residential zones. Uh, adding duplexes, triplexes, an allowance for those products in residential zones. Mm-hmm. And... Um, Authorizing accessory dwelling units uh, in all Which residential is huge. zones, yeah. um, and that's just uh, that's just kind of a first step. It had a long list, but those are some of the things that cities are able to contemplate now. Randy, many of the uh, measures you mentioned, like minimum zoning and duplexes on corner lots, uh, these would represent some pretty big changes for many cities. What do you think the uptake's going to be? Well. I, th- I think what we're seeing with that is a it's a reflection of the dire need for, for change. And I think we're going to see a range of responses to that. Uh, cities are going to be reluctant at first, but I think as they start looking at these tools, um, the tools are going to make more sense. There's rational. There's a, there's a rationale to them. The challenge is going to be certainly preserving neighborhood character while accommodating that growth. Here's the big risk is to the extent that there is major resistance to that growth, I think it's going to uh, preclude our ability to maintain neighborhood character because we're going to mm-hmm. have we're going to yeah. be fighting over whether or not to grow. But we don't get that choice because you, you you just you can't build a wall no. and we don't want to let go of of our major employers that give us this yes. this great economy. Yeah, growth is not an option at this point with all the employment going on. And we have unique Mm -hmm. geography here, too, surrounded by water. There's almost so much land. We don't have a choice but to get denser, right? Absolutely. And and you have the, yeah, you have the geographic constraints. And then we made a choice to protect our rural and resource lands and not, and try not to sprawl. So Mm -hmm. we want to focus our growth in the urban areas. Yeah, it's hard Mm -hmm. to have the best of both worlds. (laughs) Yes, <laughs> very cake challenging. And eat it too. So, Randy, what do you think about you know? Um, does this have some completion with the housing issues, or what's your what's your thought around that? I think it is. Um, I think the legislature, the state legislature, is going to continue to work on housing issues, and that is a good news, bad news thing. I think for mm-hmm. 
for some cities who have been reluctant to embrace the reality of growth, um, uh, there could be some top-down mandates that mm-hmm. they're going to be uncomfortable with. Yeah. But the if you're a legislator, you're hearing a lot from your constituents about housing affordability, yeah. and, and they just don't have the option to let it go. They're going to have to work on it. Yeah. And, you know, housing affordability has always been something that's been a top conversation in in trying to manage around. But the lack of inventory and the lack of housing that we've had for so long to the extreme that we did, this was a first. So hopefully what we're learning in this time when we come up with some of these solutions is how to make sure that we don't run into this problem again down the road in the future. Well put. Yeah. Absolutely right. Yeah. Randy, so I heard we've made some huge changes to uh, regulations regarding mother-in-law units or accessory dwelling. You mentioned it a few times previously. Can you uh, expand on that a little bit? Yeah, I think the most aggressive changes we've seen in the region have been in the city of Seattle. And uh, I'll, just, I'll just give you a quick overview of what Seattle's adopted. They're now going to allow two units um, per lot. Uh, they are removing the off-street parking requirement. Uh, they're removing the owner occupancy requirement. That's huge. Um, yeah. So that means you could have three units, the principal house and two ADUs, and no owner occupant. Um, the The challenging part is that they are using floor area ratio to limit the size of new single family homes to encourage ADUs. Yeah. So they're exempting. Um, you you kind of get credits when you build ADU, and if you're just building a principal unit. Um, you're going to be limited uh, to uh, to about 2,500 square feet, mm. which is which, very interesting, very aggressive. Um, I'll just leave it there. <laughs> yeah, and I'm, you know, I'm really yeah. excited about it, but I don't live in proper Seattle. So plus I'm in the mortgage industry, so I really want to see this this change coming. So it's you know kind of interesting to hear how the conversation is going to go with people that are in uh, proper Seattle. So Randy, do you expect other cities in the region to follow suit? Most cities in our region are looking at uh, adjusting their ADU regulations to make them easier to build. And I think, I feel like Seattle going to what is, you know, kind of the, the bleeding edge of the issue will um, will learn things. We'll get some best practices going on and other cities can employ those. Um, there are a lot of process issues with ADU in terms of regulations that yeah. could, if you could make it easy, the homeowner could take, uh, you know, uh, get some some um, financial assistance, do a refi, yeah. build an ADU, yes. get some income into that residence, going yeah. things like that. And I think it's it'll be easier if it's understandable from a regulatory perspective for the applicant. Of course. It's pretty cool. I mean, I, I see opportunity here for a huge lot of people, a huge opportunity for rental income yeah. and just less restraints. And, I mean, if you look at the bright side of this, this is this is fantastic for our local uh, our local Seattle here. Mm-hmm. So, you know, a friend of mine, they've got uh, they've got kids newly married. Uh, the kids are going to take the principal residence. The parents are going to yeah. live in the ADU yeah. and nice. help with uh, take care of the grandkids yeah. that are coming. And it's a win win. They're they're snowbirds, so they're not there all the time, but they're there when it counts. We'll start having some multi generation uh, yeah. properties. Yes, Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So um, I got to give you, I know you're so passionate about this, Randy. What is a, a call to action for individuals? How can, how can people and listeners just get involved to really expedite this process? I, I, we've, we've talked about this before, but it's really, uh, I really encourage people to get engaged with their local communities and be a part of the solution on how our community is going to grow. Articulate what are those things you want in your community um, in terms of, of neighborhood commercial districts you can walk to and 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 be supportive in inviting the right investors in yeah. to make projects that are that are beautiful and yeah. that add to your neighborhood. Somebody's got to get involved. So if you're listening to this show, and why not you? Randy, thank you so much Thanks for so coming much. in studio. Really Great appreciate to see you it. Both. You thank too. You and coming up next on the Money Hour, catching yourself when thinking defensively. D Gupta of D Coaching, right here on 11:50 a.m. KKNW. After the short break.